Today we're picking up our study in the book of Romans. So I want to invite you to open to Romans chapter 7. As you're turning there, I want to remind you of some of the context. We've been out of the book for a few Sundays. But the Apostle Paul has demonstrated uh, throughout this letter that the gospel alone is the power of God for salvation. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And this isn't a righteousness that God demands of us, but a righteousness that he gives to us. A righteousness that is imputed to us and received by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now the free offer of the gospel and this message that salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, raises a few questions, naturally, both for Paul's original audience and hopefully for us as well. And one of those questions really concerns the role of the law, particularly in the life of a believer. If we are saved completely by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, if your obedience to the law plays no role in your justification, if your relationship with God is based solely on the righteousness of Christ given to you, then what role, if any, does the law play in your life and in mine? Perhaps this is a question that you've asked before. It's an appropriate question for us to wrestle with. I think it's a natural question for anyone who takes the grace of God seriously and is listening and enjoying the freedom of the gospel. And Paul is going to help us answer this question this morning in Romans chapter 7. Well, I, I've learned one lesson the hard way on more than one occasion, and it's this, that good instructions don't guarantee that I will be able to accomplish the project that I've set out to accomplish. I've been reminded of this uh, on several occasions in the last few weeks as we've moved into a new home and as we've assembled furniture and begun to tackle uh, a few home improvement projects. Uh, in fact, just last week I was uh, starting to put together a, a shelf. The instructions were clear. The steps were straightforward, but I was missing all the hardware. <laughs> Without the parts, the instructions weren't very helpful. In fact, it was kind of the opposite. They became frustrating and infuriating. Every time I returned to the instructions, it was just another reminder of what I was missing of what I didn't have, and of what I couldn't do. It didn't matter how many times I read the instructions or how well I knew the instructions or if my wife, as she graciously did not do, reminded me of the instructions. The instructions, though good, were powerless. Romans 7, in large part, is about the purpose and the powerlessness of the law. The law of God, for all that it can do, cannot free us from the power of sin. It can tell us what to do, but it doesn't give us any of the resources to do it. For that, we need something else. This morning, I want to consider this passage, and we kind of want to work backwards, um, looking at three things this morning. First, the beauty of the law. Second, the limitations of the law. And finally, at the power of our union with Christ. 
So the first thing I want you to notice in this text is the beauty of God's law. Paul ends this section by celebrating the beauty of God's law. In verse 12, he concludes, so the law, the law is holy, and the commandments are holy, righteous, and good. You know, this is a thought that Paul's Jewish readers would have shared, a thought that he is pulling straight from the pages of the Old Testament, from the Pentateuch and from the mouth of the prophets, the lips of David and the rest of the psalmists. Psalm 119, David can declare, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. He says that the word of God is sweeter to him than honey. The man who keeps the law is compared to a tree planted by streams of flowing water. The law is good. And it's good for at least two reasons. First, it reveals the character of God. And second, it, it exposes our own need for Christ. It shows us who God is and what he requires of us. The law of God reveals his character and the path of, of human flourishing. It promises life to the man or woman who keeps it. The promise to Adam in the garden, to Israel at the foot of Sinai, is that the man who does these things would live. And indeed, Paul echoes that promise in verse 11. As far as we order our life according to the word of God, we will flourish. And any time we live, we speak, we act in ways that are contrary to the law of God, we do so to our own harm, to the harm of those around us. And sadly, as we all are so familiar with, the reality is none of us can do this. None of us can keep the law of God. The law of Moses was never intended to save Israel. Life was promised, but it was designed to imprison Israel in their sin, to reveal their sin, and to increase in their hearts and their minds a longing for the promised Messiah. So the law is good insofar as it does the exact same thing to us. It's holy, it's right, and good. Not only because it reveals the character, the glory of God, but because it reveals the depth of our sin. Paul says in verse 7, if it had not been for the law, If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Indeed, this is a, a thought that he introduced to us even earlier in the book, all the way back in chapter 3, verse 20, telling us that no one will be justified by keeping the law, since through the law comes knowledge awareness of sin. I think this is what Paul means in verse 8 and 9 when he says, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. I, Paul, was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Paul's not saying that, that he or that we are sinless apart from the law but that apart from the law, we are oblivious to our sin. Through the law of God, Paul became aware of his sinfulness, convinced 
of his own need for the Messiah. This is an example of the law doing what the law was designed to do. Brothers and sisters, the law of God is good. Through the law, we not only see the glory and the character and the perfection of our God, but we are reminded of our own weakness and need. Like a flood lamp, the law reveals the perfection of our King. And like a mirror, it exposes to us our imperfection. The great contrast between who he is and who we are is revealed, it's made known through the law. But the law, like any tool, has its limitations. And it needs to be used in the way that God intended. When you begin to use the law in ways that it wasn't intended, it's when we often end up in trouble, hurting ourselves, frustrating ourselves, and hurting those around us. This leads to the second thought this morning, the limitation of the law. So we've talked about what the law can do, but there's plenty that the law can't do. The law can tell us what we need to do, but it can never, ever give us the power to do it. And this is true both before and after we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The law can tell you what you need to do. It can show you where you fall short, all the ways that you need to change. But the law, even in the life of the believer, cannot give us the power to change. It makes for a great instruction manual but it doesn't give us the resources we need to build. Or to change illustrations, Sinclair Ferguson compares the law to a set of train tracks. He says it can set the direction in which the train ought to move, but it can't help it move. It can't supply any power. Without an engine to pull, the boxcars will just sit on the tracks. Rules and regulations cannot change the human heart. They do nothing to curb our tendencies towards sin, nor to move us towards the glory of God. In fact, the law, as Paul points out in our text this morning, can actually have the opposite effect. Far from keeping us from sin, the law often provokes us to sin. Look at what he says in verse 5. Paul says, While we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. The law aroused by our sinful passions. Or consider verse 8, where he says, But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. The law can't curb our sinful passions. It actually provokes them. The law didn't free Paul from coveting. Do you hear what he says? It made him more covetous. The law won't free you from addiction and porn. In fact, it may inflame your passions. The law won't free you from greed, 
It will only increase your idolatry. The law won't free you from your anger. It may make you more insecure and violent. The law won't free you from selfishness. It will just make you self-righteous in a religious way. You know, I'm, I'm fairly certain that if I set a box out front in the foyer this morning, most of you would have come into church without ever noticing it, and certainly without ever being tempted to look inside. But if Christy placed the box out in the foyer this morning, and then I told the whole church not to look in the box, (laughs) then all of a sudden, the calculations have changed. And every single person in here would tune out for the remainder of the sermon and, and think completely about what is in that box. All of your conversations over lunch today would center around your box-based suspicions. It's nothing more. The law can't keep us from sin. In fact, it often leads us towards greater temptation. Paul's point here is that our sinful flesh will always use God's good commandments to lead us astray. And we still haven't moved to really the heart of Paul's message and the most important part of this passage, but I want to tie these two thoughts about the law together and make a few applications about the law in our life. First, the law is good, and it does have a proper place in your life and in mine. But that place is limited. We need the law, first and foremost, to continue to remind us of our need for Jesus. Even if you have been a Christian for decades, even if you have walked with him for 40, 50, 60 years, there is room for you to grow. You never grow beyond your dependence in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the law should make us humble. The law, as Christians, is designed to foster a dependence in Jesus and a joy in the salvation that we have through him. So part of what this means is as the law points out your sin, as I hope it does, week in and week out, it doesn't need to lead us to despair. In fact, in in one way, it can actually lead to greater joy. The more you see, the more you are aware of your sin, the more you're able to appreciate the grace of God. The more you see your shortcomings, the more you can celebrate the cross. The more you know of your unrighteousness, the more you're laid to rest in the righteousness of another. The more you understand your depravity, the more desperate you cling to Christ. All of this is good. But there's a danger as well in the way that we can use the law in our life or in the life of those around us. The law can show us where we need to change, but the law cannot give you the power to change. You cannot use the law as a means of transformation and change. You cannot use the law as a a means and a tool for your sanctification or sanctification in the life of your children, your spouse, your friends. I've thought about this a lot this week. I want to see my kids flourish. I want to see them love the Lord with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. I want to see them love their neighbor as themselves. 
but I have to constantly remind myself that the law, the law will not achieve this. The more law, the more force, the more guilt, the more shame I heap on others, and I've heaped plenty, the further away from Christ I lead them. In fact, if I'm not careful, if you're not careful, all the rules, all the restrictions, all the boundaries and borders that we set in place can actually lead our children and those we love towards the sin that we're trying to keep them from. That, that's a terrifying and humbling thought. So what do they need? And what do I need? And what do you need? What do we need in order to change? We need the Spirit of Christ. And, and that's ultimately in this text where Paul is leading us. He's trying to draw our eyes and our attention as Christians to something better and more powerful than the law, something that actually is designed and able to bring transformation and change. I believe that the, the central part of this whole passage is found in verse 4. Our final point, the power of our union with Christ. Verse 4, you read this, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit to God. Christians have died to the law in order that they may belong to Christ and bear fruit to the glory of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Through faith, you are not only forgiven, you are not only free from the condemnation of the law. Through faith, you have been set free and are now delivered from the power and the tyranny of the law. It no longer has power over you. And, and Paul drives this point home to us and to his original readers in a, in a very strange illustration. He points out that under the law of Moses, a wife was only bound to her husband while he lived. So if he died, she was free to marry another man. And Paul says, in effect, that is exactly what happens to us. At one time, we were married. We were bound. We were united to the law. But we have experienced a death. Through our union with Jesus Christ, we have died. And on the backside of that death, you are now free from your obligation to the law and you are bound in marriage to Jesus Christ. This had a very particular application for first century Jews. It meant that they and the Gentile converts around them no longer had to live under the yoke of the Mosaic law. And indeed, for the first century church, this was a major upheaval. They didn't have to observe Jewish rituals and rites. And praise God, that, that's true for us today. You don't have to be circumcised. You're allowed to eat pork. But it has a much better application than even pork. Before we came to Christ, we all lived under some sort of law. Some sort of system and standard was used to measure your value 
your worth and that you use to measure the value and the worth of those around you. For some of you, it may have been religious performance, the desire to keep all the rules, to know all the Sunday school answers. But for many of us, it was something very different. It may be academic, music, athletic, business success. We live under the law any time we feel the need to justify ourselves by what we do, whether it's in the classroom, in the boardroom, in the band room, or, or right here in worship. This is life. That is life lived under the law. Anytime we feel this sort of performance mentality creep in, we know that we're living under the law. It's so easy for us to find our identity, our worth, our value in these things. It doesn't matter if you're religious or not. Apart from Christ, every single one of us has lived under the law. We know the oppression. We were married to this kind of thinking. And it's the worst kind of marriage that we could imagine. To feel that your worth, your value, your security in the relationships were bound to your performance and to what you can do. And, and Paul, throughout this letter, and here in the beginning verses of chapter 7, is reminding us that the gospel has completely freed us from this sort of thinking. It liberates us from the tyranny of the law and the need to prove yourself to God or to anyone else in here. That's what Paul means when he says that you have died to the law. You live by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And your standing, your status, your righteousness are found in him and in him alone. Like a wife who inherits the wealth, the status, the privilege of her husband all that Christ has and all that Christ is now belongs to you. That's amazing. But follow Paul's logic out a little further. Your release from the law doesn't simply lead to this sort of joyful freedom and it certainly doesn't lead to lawlessness and sin. It leads to a fresh union with Christ that allows you for the first time in your life to bear fruit to the glory of God. Look again at what Paul says in verse 4. We died to the law through the body of Christ, that is, through his resurrection, so that we might belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, and therefore can never die again, in order that you might bear fruit to God. You belong to Christ. Individually, you are his bondservant. Collectively, we are his bride. Our union with Christ, far from leading us into sin, actually gives us the power to overcome sin. In Christ, we are called and we are able to bear fruit to the glory of God. And this isn't just a new form of works. Let's return to that illustration of the instruction manual. How do you envision sanctification? How do you think about the Christian life? When Christ comes to us and finds us with the instruction manual in our hands, he doesn't simply give us a pep talk he doesn't simply say, oh, I lived on the world for 33 years and I was able to keep the law. He doesn't simply 
dump a bunch of new materials and tools in our lap and tell us to get to work. I think this is sometimes the way we think of sanctification. Rather like a father, like a brother, like a neighbor, like a friend, like a beloved husband, he helps us to build. He doesn't leave us alone. He picks up a board and he begins to measure. He takes a saw and he helps us to cut. He reaches for a hammer and nails and he begins to build. And suddenly our hands are moving too. His arms are wrapped around us and we feel his strength. This is life in the spirit. This is union with Christ. Christ did what the law, weakened by the flesh, could never do. In order that you and I, who now walk and are filled with his spirit, through him, can bear fruit to the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, since you have died to the law, since you are united to Christ and filled with the Spirit, you can bear fruit to the glory of God. Now, this won't be easy, and we'll talk about the struggle in the weeks to come, but you can do what you were never able to do before through your union with Christ and through the power of the Spirit. You can serve God in a new and living way. And you will never do it perfectly. You'll stumble, and you'll fall, you'll be tempted, and you'll fail. But we know that those failures don't define us. And we know that our standing before the Lord is secure. And we know that we are clothed in the righteousness of another. And we know that we belong to Christ, and he continues to work. So how do we know? What brings glory to God? Well, for that, for those of us who are united to Christ by faith, who are filled with the Spirit, we could safely return to the law. Not as a means to manufacture our own righteousness, not as a system of of self-justification and pride, not as a source of spiritual strength, but as a blueprint and as a roadmap to the Christian life. Because the law indeed is holy and right and good.